the lair of the lion, a jungle called Tiger Stadium in Detroit. In the third week of the NFL season, the hungry Detroit Lions sought to devour the Atlanta Falcons, and a sellout crowd awaited the bitter battle that would be waged inside. Then, the Lions and the Falcons took the field. Coach Joe Schmidt has greatly changed the face of the Lion in his four years there. Eleven of the 22 starters are his own draft picks, not the least of which is Greg Landry, the 24-year-old quarterback from UMass, who Schmidt says always generates something when he's in there. Landry was not sharp on the Lions' opening day loss to the Vikings, but the following week against the Patriots, receiver Larry Walton, Charlie Sanders, and a powerful running attack helped Landry guide his team to an easy win. The great strength of the Lions, however, is their defense, led by Mike Lucci. At times, they play with too much abandon, and as a result, have been burned by the big play. But this gambling, punishing style was the essence of the Lions' success last year and carried them to the playoffs. Coach Norm Van Brocklin has finally brought the Falcons in from the cold. He, too, has made many changes since he took over, only now starting to pay dividends. Quarterback Bob Berry played briefly for the Dutchman at Minnesota and went to his alma mater, Oregon. Maybe this is why he's remained in the Dutchman's favor, which is not an easy task. Van Brockton loves to get to the goal line fast and quick, and he's installed two rookie receivers to help Barry do this. They may have to. The Falcons' defense, although young and strong up front, is weak in the secondary, and so far this year they rank 10th in total defense. But with an opening day win and a tie last week, Atlanta was first in the NFC West and sensed a chance for their best season ever. The Lions just have to keep on winning to keep pace with the Vikings, hoping to squeeze in as a wild card if they don't win their division, the NFC Central. I'm Bob Delaney, and this is the NFL Game of the Week. The Detroit Lions versus the Atlanta Falcons. On the first series of the game, the Falcons and Bob Berry attempted to run on the second-best rushing defense in the NFC. Barry and setback Art Malone found out that this was not to be the strategy to beat the Lions. The Falcons went gradually backward twice and hit disaster on the third try as Cannonball Butler fumbled into the hands of Mike Weger, number 28, and the Lions had a quick 7-0 lead. On a repeat of the fumble, Butler, on a quick trap, was hit hard at the line, and Weger caught the ball on the fly. Watch Lem Barney trailing the play, turn it on, to make the key block that allowed Weger to score untouched. The Lions' defense began the scoring, as they did the week before against New England, and led 7-0. The Falcons' second series saw the very same thing happen. A fake, a pitch out, a fumble, a lion recovery. On a repeat, we can see that the Falcons were using the I formation, then shifting out of the set. This moved linebacker Mike Lucci over to key on setback Malone on the play, and he tried to get the ball as Malone fumbled. A perfect play by the linebacker, although it was the Lions' other veteran backer, Wayne Walker, who came up with it at the Falcons' 25. The Lions' offense now had its first possession, and behind the running of number 42, Alty Taylor, drove goalward. Running and short passes. This is the heart of the Lions' offense, but a great individual effort by Greg Brezina stopped their next play. However, a major penalty cost Atlanta 15, and from the two, Steve Owens rumbled through a gaping hole over right tackle. With six minutes gone, it was 14 to nothing Lions, the easy way, and it looked like Atlanta was in for a long day in the jungle. 
Down by 14 and steaming mad at his players' inability to hold the ball, Van Brocklin ended all semblance of the running game. Barry now came out firing. On this last play, linebacker Mike Lucci, number 53, again keyed on Malone, following him on his pass route and saving a longer gain with this tackle. Barry was passing nearly every down. The Lions knew it, but couldn't stop him or his receivers, especially Jim Mitchell, number 86. Now at the Lions 13, it was Barry to Mitchell again, and the big tight end made a beautiful catch for the score. On a repeat of the score, watch center Jeff Van Note keep out number 77 Dick Eby and give Barry time to hit Mitchell wide open in the end zone. Mitchell was the Falcons' leading receiver last year and it put Atlanta back in the game to stay 14-7. Down by seven, Atlanta kicked off to Ron Jesse. It was a poor kick, but good coverage made it work in their favor as Jesse pussyfooted around and was trapped on his five. Jesse would later make up for it. The Falcons kept Detroit deep in a hole on this series. Landry underthrew McCullough and was almost intercepted by safety Tom McCauley, as so he went back to his strong running game, which worked for a while. With Owens, Farr, and Taylor, the Lions boast a multi-styled ground game suited for any defense, and they gained over 70 yards in the first half. The Lions' offensive line, however, was having much less success giving Landry time to throw. He had to eat it on third down, and a short punt sent Atlanta up in Lion land. Barry attempted an infrequent run, and the result was as expected, another fumble. The Falcons kept this one, however, but were unable to convert it to seven as the Lions' pass rush reared its ugly hand, Larry Hand, number 74, as the first quarter ended. The second quarter began with more good defense from Mike Lucci and the Lions. Atlanta had to settle for a three-pointer from rookie Bill Bell. It was now 14 to 10, Lions. Remember Ron Jesse, the Lions return man who pussyfooted the last kickoff? This time, Jesse chose the straight and narrow, ducked one man, used his screen blocking, and went 97 yards to a touchdown. The Lions were playing opportunistic football. Their offense had not outgamed the Falcons and would total only 120 yards for the half. But their defense and special teams had produced two scores and they now led 21 to 10. It took Bob Barry just four plays to get it back. The first play was unique, a run that didn't result in a fumble. But Barry was kidding no one. Passing was his forte. He led the NFC before this game, and he continued to go up top on nearly every play, using rookie Ken Burrow, number 82, as his prime target. Two plays later, Barry hit Burrow on a deep post, beating Wayne Rasmussen and Barney for the touchdown. The King Falcon was picking the Lions secondary clean and would gain nearly 200 yards passing in the half alone. The Lions' bugaboo, the big play, had again cost them, and the Falcons were down by four with two minutes gone in the second quarter, 
2117. Landry went to the air on his next series, and the Lions' offense, which hadn't shown much so far, began to roll. First to Earl McCullough, then to Larry Walton, number 49, and Landry's passing, which had not looked sharp so far this year, had the Lions over midfield. Then Landry tried to force a pass to his big receiver, tight end Charlie Sanders, and he paid for it. Rookie Tom Hayes, number 27, stole the underthrown pass away, and Atlanta had a chance to take the lead for the first time. After a penalty set them back, it looked like they would. Another Barry to Burrow bomb, another long gain, 66 yards to the Lions' 25. Burrow hurt his wrist and wisely removed himself from the game after a brilliant first-half performance. First and ten on the 25. The Lions' man-to-man -man coverage had been burned badly, but Mike Wieger adroitly saved a score here. A beautiful play-action fake set up the Lions on second down, but Wieger again came over to prevent a longer gain. Then on third down, Barry went for the score again, but like Landry, forced his throw into a horde of Lions. Wayne Rasmussen came up with a big play, and the Lions' defense had saved themselves. On a repeat, watch number 53, Lucci, read the pass and react quickly, as Barry's pass was intercepted by the leaping Rasmussen. A personal foul gave the Lions the ball on the 10, with under two minutes left in the half. Fumbolitis strikes again. This time it hit Alty Taylor on his own 10. Greg Brezina scooped it up and almost went in for a touchdown. The Falcons had the ball on the Lions three in a wild first half that still had plenty to see. Art Malone dove over from the one and it was now 24-21 Falcons with 25 seconds left. The Falcons went for the short squib kick to prevent Jesse from returning. It was a calculated risk on Van Brocklin's part, but in retrospect, it backfired. The Lions recovered, but more important, they had field position at their 47 with 17 seconds left. It looked as if time would run out as Landry was dumped on his own 37, but Detroit called time. Time for one last play, five seconds left. Against a prevent, no way to score, right? Wrong. Larry Walton's 56-yard touchdown catch and run was the perfect ending to a first half that was a 30-minute halftime carnival in itself. A Pandora's box had opened, and almost every possible thing that could happen had happened. 28-24 Lions with 30 minutes yet to play. In the second half, the Detroit Lions almost lost their 28-24 lead on their first series. But quarterback Greg Landry is a third runner in the Lion backfield, and his footwork often delivered Detroit from sticky situations. the running game would start to bog down, Landry steamed one of his infrequent passes. 
Only five times in the second half did Landry choose the overhead route. The Lions reached the Atlanta 16 solely on Landry's arm and his ability to make the most out of treacherous situations. From the 16, Landry went for six, but his bullet sailed away from wide open Charlie Sanders, number 88. Shrewdly, the young general came back to Sanders on the very next play, and the result was a Lions touchdown and a harsh landing for the all-pro tight end. A second look reveals that Landry's protection was immaculate and that his feathery throw made Sanders stretch every fiber of his body, allowing him no time to cushion his crushing rendezvous with the ground. Sanders all-out efforts and diving grabs have meant many a frequent TKO from the Tiger Stadium sod. But Atlanta's discomfort was even greater as they trailed the Lions by 11 points, 35-24. Quarterback Bob Barry tried to deceive the Lions with a false reverse and screen pass to Cannonball Butler. But number 83, defensive end Jim Mitchell, stayed at home and busted up the play. Then with the Detroit ends and tackles stunting, Barry threw into the teeth of a double team on Jim Mitchell and paid for it with an interception by Dick LeBeau. The theft was the 58th of LeBeau's career and made him the NFL's third leading all-time interceptor. The turnover had set the offense up nicely inside the Falcons 20, but Detroit found the young Atlanta defense unyielding on three pops through the line. So on fourth down, they trotted out Errol Mann and his field goal enlarged the lead to 38-24. Trailing by 14 points, Barry went to his burly tight end Jim Mitchell, whose roughhouse style decimated the Lions secondary. Barry's attempt to balance out his attack with some running proved fruitless. So he came back throwing and pinpointed a perfect strike to set back Art Malone through two defenders. With it first and 10 on the Detroit 25, the stubby quarterback found flashy Ken Burrow running unmolested behind safety Wayne Rasmussen and lobbed his third touchdown of the day. Another view shows that when Barry's only tormentor, number 74, Larry Hand, was ridden out of the play, he had many precious seconds to scan the secondary. Barry wisely selected the sleek rookie from San Diego State, who on the day grabbed six passes for 190 yards. Now Detroit's margin was only a touchdown, and with time dying in the third quarter, they unleashed the full fury of setback Steve Owens whose hard running and surprisingly soft hands decided this game's outcome. In the last quarter, the Lions came straight at Atlanta. It was basic, bruising football, more akin to the Big Ten than the NFL. Owens ripped through tiny seams in the Falcon defense, carrying two and three tacklers with him on every play. Owens, the former Heisman Trophy winner, used to carry the ball 30 to 40 times a game at Oklahoma, where his durability wore down defenses. As they weakened, he seemed to grow stronger with every carry. Owens had many doubters when he came to the pros, but now he was ramming the Heisman jinx right down the Falcons' throat. At the Falcon 4, the Lion drive ended when Landry's pass trickled through Earl McCullough's hands in the end zone. On reviewing the last play, we can see that Landry never looked in McCullough's direction until the last instant. 
His pass was true, but McCullough never looked the ball into his hands and muffed a sure touchdown. Instead of seven points, Detroit settled for three as Harold Mann's field goal gave the Lions a 41-31 spread. The Detroit drive had lasted almost seven minutes, so Bob Barry went to the sideline pattern to preserve the clock. A surprise quick hitter did not fool the quick hitting Lions, so Barry went for the safety of the sidelines again, and Lem Barney almost picked him clean. On third and eight, the determined running of Cannonball Butler picked up seven yards. Now it was fourth and one on their own 45. It was no time for conservative thinking, so Barry disdained the run. Barry caught the Lions blitzing, but it was trusty old Dick LeBeau who caught the misdirected pass. With four minutes remaining and holding a 10-point lead, Detroit would try to chew up the clock. Once again, it was Steve Owens carrying the ball and tacklers on every play. Owens running consumed almost three minutes as Detroit powered inside the Falcon 50 before they were forced to punt. On fourth down, all the white shirts came and airborne John Small blocked Herman Weaver's punt. It seemed that half the Falcons team had a shot at the ball before their alert rookie cornerback Tom Hayes scooped it up and sprinted for the touchdown. Now the Lion lead was just three points and if Atlanta could recover their onside kick, a tie was just a field goal away. Only 30 seconds remained. The onside kick must combine spin with confusing bounces. However, Bill Bell's attempt had neither and went right into the hands of reserve tight end Craig Cotton, number 87, and all chance for victory was lost. The remorseless clock ticked away Atlanta's fate as Detroit earned their second victory in three games. Now the NFC Central Division was deadlocked in a four-way tie for first place, with all its members possessing identical two-and-one records. The Atlanta Falcons had done their thing as league-leading quarterback Bob Barry passed for over 300 yards, but Detroit had done their thing also and rushed for over 200 yards. On this Sunday, this very special black and blue division brand of crunch had its day, and the Detroit Lions won 41-38.